Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to this week's podcast. Before I begin, I just got to thank everybody that I met out in Portland. It was such an amazing time. I met new friends that I'd never met before. I'd met friends that I'd never met in person before, but I'd been talking to for a while. And it was just an absolute blast. I know I say this after every expo, big or small, but honestly, if you're part of the retro gaming community and you care enough to listen to this podcast, you'd probably care enough to to go to one of these expos. And I think most people would be surprised at how positive and happy all of these are, especially if you're, you know, if you're used to forums and stuff like that, it would be extra surprising. Um, honestly, it's just such a great time. There were so many cool things and cool people there. And I'm really looking forward to hopefully being or getting the opportunity to present at these next year as well. I believe that's it for me for the end of the year. Um, and I think the next expo season starts in like April. But uh, honestly, uh, if you're out there and you throw one of these expos, please reach out to me because I always have such a good time doing presentations, hanging out with people and, you know, all that lovely stuff. But anyway, let's jump into the news. And don't forget, Shia, it's Wednesday. First up, Analog has just announced the Analog Pocket. It's not available for pre-order yet. You have to sign up on their website for a mailing list, but they announced most of the details on it. And it looks like a pretty incredible machine. It's essentially one of the analog machines in a handheld form factor, and a form factor that I personally think is probably gonna be one of the most comfortable. Um, imagine Game Boy Color style with four front buttons and two triggers in the back, kind of by where the cartridges go in. And there's a whole bunch of features up about it. Um, I'm just going to run through them super quick just because I don't want to concentrate too much while it's still in announcement phase. Um, but it supports Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance, which is a new core that Kevin had never made before, as well as um, other brand new cores are Neo Geo Pocket Color and Atari Lynx. So that pretty much covers all of the retro gaming handhelds from the 80s and 90s then. It's pretty impressive. Um, I haven't got a chance to talk to Kevin yet about it. Uh, hopefully I could do so in an interview form again, but that alone is pretty impressive. Uh, but there's also going to be, uh, I guess they're going to open up a separate FPGA core that's on this board for other developers to make their own stuff. So I'm not really sure how that's going to work. I don't want to speculate too much on that, but it sounds like Analog is inviting some of the dev community to, to work on their devices, which is kind of neat. And they also say that there's going to be cartridge adapters that allow you to use the Game Boy Core as well as the Neo Geo Pocket Color and Lynx. Um, but, you know, I don't think Analog's ever actually released any of the cartridge adapters they promised. So I know how busy Kevin is. So um, while I'm teasing, I also understand. But, you know, there's been a lot of stuff promised that uh, either delayed or, you know, it hasn't come out yet. So I, would, I wouldn't hold your breath for a cartridge adapter. Uh, and same with the HDMI out dock. Uh, they said coming soon for that one, which, you know, who knows how long that might take. But when it is released, supposedly, it's essentially going to consoleize this and will allow you to connect with Bluetooth or through USB, which um, my strong opinion is that Bluetooth is just way too much latency and variable latency for classic consoles and classic handhelds. So uh, I personally would recommend sticking with something like a 2.4 gig USB wireless controller should you do that. But... Overall, it just it looks like a really impressive device uh, and something that I would, you know, I'm not, I'm really not a handheld gamer. I was as a kid, and now I prefer to play on a big screen, but I could absolutely see the appeal of buying something like this and wanting to connect it to my TV as well to have the, uh, the best of both worlds. Now, price is $199 plus shipping. And once again, let's just remember that Analog's notorious for charging the, some of the highest shipping prices out there. Uh, so, you know, some people like to like to jump on me when I call them out for that, but it's just the truth. It's uh, very expensive to, to have any of their products shipped. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to checking this out. I, I really, really want to talk to Kevin more about it and see if he's allowed to tell me anything about it at all. And as always, I always invite Chris Tabor on and I never get a response. I usually just get blown off. So it's always an open invitation for Chris to come on. I would love to hear his thoughts on things that weren't in the context of just... Uh, of pre-agreed upon interviews and quotes that he sends some of the bigger publications. I'd like to actually hear from him. So I don't know if, if you know, Chris reach out to him because I think now's the time for us to really hear his side, especially when I'm sitting here, you know, speculating on things that I haven't spoken to him about. Maybe there really is a good reason about the shipping. I mean, there isn't. 
but <laughs> who knows? <laughs> so um, I'll keep everybody updated as to when there's going to be an actual pre-order or an official release date, but it's looking like early next year, which I would assume February, March, because that's usually the cycle that Analog follows for releasing products. Last week, I posted a video comparison of the original Game Boy Advance backlit screens, the AGS-101, as well as the new IPS backlit screens that were just released. I had version 2 of the ribbon cable, which had a circuit that uh, removed any of the screen tearing some of the original installs had. And overall, in my very limited time with it, it seemed better in absolutely every way, except it didn't have the original gridline look. So if you're just going in for, you know, if you don't have a backlit Game Boy Advance at all, um, you probably wouldn't even realize that, and you're probably going to love this screen. Even if you do have a backlit AGS-101, this is all about preference at this point. Some people just prefer the look of that grid line because they want the original look and feel of the Game Boy, but I think a lot of other people would, would really appreciate the smoother scrolling and just the better look overall of the high-resolution screen. Maybe there'll someday be an update that allows for grid line scan lines so it'll solve all the problems, but for now it seemed really cool. Uh, I didn't have time to do a full comparison. I'd always like to do things like lag tests and stuff like that, so I didn't have a time to do that at all. And I also don't have a macro lens, and I thought I was going to get away with doing a comparison without it, but it just, I spent all day on this video, a short little video, and I, I couldn't really get the angles and the captures that I wanted from it. So somebody on Twitter that always helps me out with this stuff recommended I use a black box instead of a white box. And obviously the, the macro screen would have been a really big help. So someday I do plan on going back and re-reviewing all of these and digging in pretty deep with lag tests and stuff like that, as well as possibly even comparing the new analog pocket along with it, just so people get a sense. But for now, I could confidently say that if you don't have a backlit Game Boy Advance, the IPS backlit, backlit screen is great. They're fairly inexpensive, and it's something that you could be confident installing knowing that it's not going to take away from the experience. If you already have a backlit Game Boy Advance, I don't know. It's a tough one because, you know, what, what's a bigger deal to you? The, the most sharp, picture sharp and smooth picture quality or that original grid line look? And that's really up to you. But check out the video. Uh, excuse the glare. And uh, I guess the best way to watch it would be on a 4K screen because I shot it with a 4K, 4K60 camera. Because sometimes when you watch on your phone and stuff like that, it, it squishes the image down in a way that changes the way it looks. But... Uh, either way, you know, hope you enjoyed the video, and someday I'll go back and do a, a deeper dive into it. There's now an open source operating system that runs on the Z80 chip, including devices like the Master System and Sega Genesis. And generally speaking, when you have a bunch of very technical people that are forced to work within very strict confines, you get cool stuff like this out of it. I think the most famous scene in, in modern culture is that scene in Apollo 13 where they dump a pile of stuff on the table and say, hey, this is everything that's in the ship. Let's see how we could fix it. And that kind of is what this reminded me of. Um, there's also a, a guide for people that want to make a keyboard adapter so you could use a keyboard with it. And I think there's a few uh, lightweight application packages as well. And while at the moment it's more of just like a you know, a proof of concept type of thing. I'm wondering if this could lead to different test tools or, or, or heck, just some more fun. I don't know. I just, I thought it was a really neat thing. The one thing that did kind of crack me up is when I started reading about why they decided to do this, it's because it's a group of people that thinks uh, the entire world is about to go into a collapse and, you know, the society as we know it will be gone soon. So while it's not flat earthers, uh, this is at least technically feasible um, you know, if you're going to walk down this road and, and go down, uh, you know, the development path on this, just a very friendly and polite warning of what you might run into. I don't want people to, uh, to click through this through my site and assume that I'm a tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorist. So, you know, I mean, it's not necessarily a bad thing at all, but some of those groups really go way too far. I don't know if anybody remembers, but the Flat Earth Society started out as a prank. Uh, along the same times as Bonsai Kitten and a few others. So, uh, you know, I don't think this is a prank, but uh, strap in if you're going to go <laughs> go down the rabbit hole of it. But, you know, my opinions aside, it's still an amazing feat to have an operating system running on a Z80. So I would check it out just for the heck of it, just to, you know, if you're interested in OS development, just to see how they did it. Here's a pretty neat find. 
Kurt Vendel, the historian behind the Atari Museum History Project, found some technical schematics for the Atari 7800 in a dumpster. So, uh, he's just released those to the public, and these are some pretty technical engineering schematics that could probably be used to fully reverse engineer it and get a pretty much one-to-one -one recreation on something like the Mister. I believe there's a few pieces missing, but considering how much project the entire uh, Mr. Team has made on uh, without any schematics like this, I have a feeling they might be able to figure out what's missing pretty pretty easily relative to if they didn't have all of this stuff. So that's pretty awesome. I, I love that we're still finding stuff like this laying around places, and I hope that this does eventually end up being an FPGA core that we could all share. So great find, Kurt. The developer Lotharek has just released his version of the Divide, which is a ZX Spectrum multi-purpose device that plugs right into the expansion port, and you get things like uh, controller inputs, rapid fire modules, uh, and a few other pretty cool things. So uh, this device is on sale for $65 through Lotharek shop, and I guess it was originally designed by Pavel Symbol, and this is just, uh, I think, probably an open source project that Lotharek has just made his own version of. Uh, and also, I was told that the ZX Spectrum was never released officially in the U.S., so I shouldn't call it the ZX Spectrum. <laughs> so I'm just trying to always get my naming right. Hopefully that was good enough. But if you're a fan of the console, definitely check this and the original out and see if they're devices that you would want to use or might help your gaming experience. Firebrand X has just posted a pretty interesting find on his Patreon page that some micro SD cards seem to cause more data read noise than others. I guess somebody had found a model, a specific model of the Transcend micro SD cards and didn't really have any noise when it was um, when things like the SSD S3 were reading the card, whereas certain things like the SanDisk cards, which are ones that I predominantly use, do have a, quite a bit of noise. Um, Firebrand X was able to post a FLAC file that really, you could definitely tell the difference on it. I have it linked right here, um, right here in the main post. And it's kind of an interesting thing because your average person, uh, if you hear on like a ROM cart, you hear the drive access noise, you're really only hearing it when you load the ROM for the console. So, you know, even if it's annoying, it's annoying for three seconds or something. Whereas now with optical drive emulators, some of them have to constantly access the card in order to, just like you would constantly access the CD. And if you have your console run through a stereo and the volume cranked, then it really could be noticeable. Uh, if not, I think I would, my brain probably hears it, but I, I just equate it with the same noises you might hear with your CD-ROM drive moving around, you know, that squeaking sound of the laser moving. But, you know, playing through a cranked stereo, you'd probably be able to hear it. And in the noise comparison, the specific model of Transcend card was significantly quieter. So if this is an issue for you, maybe try one of those out. Um, for me personally, I'm at least I'm not going to go out and, and swap out my SD cards because they don't really bother me on anything. But the next time I go to buy one, I'll try one of the Transcends and really see if I could hear a difference. But does anyone out there know why this might happen? Is it something like a read speed issue? So the transcends are slower, so it's a different frequency of reading or shielding on the card or something. I really couldn't even begin to guess uh, without more information as to why a card would cause more noise when being read. But I would love to hear people's opinions on this, and especially if anybody could uh, could lock down the answer. So very cool find. Uh, and just for the record, I did ask permission from Firebrand X to post this. I didn't just steal it from his Patreon page. So if you uh, if you appreciate stuff like this, consider signing up for his Patreon. It looks like Amazon has prematurely released the specs of the NVIDIA Shield Pro. They posted it on their website earlier and then immediately took it down, but it looks like it's going to be released October 28th, and I'm not sure if that's a pre-order or if actually released on the 28th for $200, and it's going to have upgraded to 3 gigabytes of RAM, an updated Tegra chip, Dolby Vision, and a refreshed remote control. Uh, the device itself does look identical to the original, but it's supposedly going to make the device 25% faster than the current model. And of course, this is the one that does support 4K. So this is uh, interesting for a few reasons. First, if you use or are looking to use a shield to do some of your media streaming or gaming, then, you know, this is kind of neat. You might want to hold off just a week for this. But the NVIDIA Shield is also very similar to a Nintendo Switch. So this might allude to what is coming for the, you know, the fabled Switch Pro 
Uh, and I'm really hoping this is it because I would love to see 4K support for the Switch. Uh, but, you know, that, that part's all speculation. Everything before that was released on uh, Amazon earlier today. So we'll see for sure when the listing goes back up. But if you're a fan of the Switch and you have a 4K TV, cross your fingers. Maybe that means next year we're getting a 4K Switch. I don't know. Luik Petit has just uploaded a website that compiles all of his lag testing into one place, and it's really fascinating for nerds like me that are super into this stuff. Um, he goes through a few things on the, uh, the hardware side from comparing different modern arcade sticks to converter boards like the Brook boards and stuff like that, and also uh, testing the game engines themselves which is something that's really uh, interesting to me because you could take something like the original Street Fighter that has just under three frames of lag on average. I guess I shouldn't call it lag. It takes about three frames on the original Street Fighter from the time you press a button to the time there's motion on the screen. And that's about 85% accurate. And then to see how that translates to certain modern ports of that game and how much more latency there is and how less consistent it is, it's kind of a fun sign. And I'm really starting to wonder how many professional gamers would notice a difference. And I'd be willing to bet quite a few. Um, you know, this is just speculation here, but I would guess that the, the consistency of the frames would matter more than the actual latency but especially when you're talking two to four frames and stuff like this. But I just talked to Brian from Retro USB. Um, I got to meet him out in his booth, and he said when he was testing the wireless AVS controller, he wrote custom software that allowed you to specify the lag. And he had professional Tetris players go in, and they said that they could no longer do their special moves, uh, starting at about eight milliseconds and going up to a full frame. So I'm kind of interested to see how all of that would apply to fighting games or really any other game where, where speed is of the utmost importance. So, you know, there's a few different ways to test lag and there's different ways that are better in certain scenarios, but Luik has absolutely nailed it on this one. Um, and I do really hope to do a video on lag that kind of does an overview of all of the stuff that he does, that I do, and that other people do in order to make this easier to understand. But for now, if you're just curious at the test results, Results, definitely check out the website. And uh, Luik had a few other th tricks up his sleeve this week, but I haven't had time to write them up yet. And they're not time sensitive, so <laughs> I'll get to that next week. But uh, a very awesome website, and I'm looking forward to following it to see future updates. The Sega Saturn emulator Yaba Senshiro has just been updated to support three more games, Assault Lanos 2, Stellar Assault SS, and Alone in the Dark 2. And this is the same emulator that just recently got HD rendering support for certain modes of Saturn games, which is pretty impressive. Um, this emulator is free, and you can find it on Windows and Android, and I believe an older version for iOS devices. I'm not sure if there's any plans to update the iOS version. And also, the Android version has a pro version that removes some of the ads or anything. To be honest, whenever I've used this, it's always been on Windows, which doesn't have the ads. So uh, I guess if you're looking to use this on your cell phone, you have a choice of free or pro version with no ads whatsoever, which is pretty fair in my opinion. Retro HQ has just announced a few updates to their Lynx game drive. Their original Lynx ROM cart, if I remember correctly, wouldn't fit inside a Model 1 Lynx with the door closed with a case on it. So it would fit fine without the case, but if you had a Model 1 Lynx, you generally would order it without it. And this updated version has been resized, so it does fit in the Model 1 with a case on. And the Model 2 was never an issue. The Model 2 always just uh, fit perfectly with the case. On top of that, it's been updated so that games load faster, but if I'm remembering correctly, it didn't load slowly at all, so I would just consider that a cool little bonus to go along with it. And also, all of the Retro HQ carts are now being branded as a product line called Game Drive, which I think is pretty neat, and I, I'm shocked somebody else hasn't come up with that previously. So all of the Retro HQ ROM carts are Game Drives. So he's got the Lynx Game Drive, the Jaguar Game Drive, etc. Uh, so a pretty cool update, and if you're a fan of the Lynx and haven't gotten a ROM cart yet, um, I would definitely pick this one up. If you already own the Lynx ROM cart, I don't think there's really a need to upgrade, especially because if you have the Model 1, it doesn't really matter if there's no case on it because you're closing it inside the Lynx anyway. But uh, of course, you know, cases are, are always nice for storing it and stuff like that. But overall, a very cool update, uh, and I'm happy to see more progress on all of those awesome carts. 
Well, that's it for this week. Before I go, I just want to say thank you one more time to every single person that I met and hung out with out in Portland. It was so much fun and it's just such an awesome experience. And I'm kind of sad that the next expo is months away, but I uh, definitely guarantee that I'll be there. Anyway, as always, thanks so much to all of you for watching and listening. And of course, thanks to everybody who supports through services like Patreon and Subscribestar because you're who's keeping all of these things going. So thanks so much and I'll see you next week.